Hey, thank you, thank you. So, I walk as I talk, so I'll be a moving target. Today, we are talking about evolutionary oral medicine and the purpose of the gateways. Now you say, gateway microbiome? That's a very, very, very new term. Gateway microbiome. Because the oral microbiome, the nasal microbiome, the placental microbiome, the vaginal microbiomes are all microbiomes that change to the environment. And they're there to protect and to be a, a gateway to let things in and not let things in. We won't talk about barrier microbiomes or the epithelial symbionts. Everything only makes sense if you look at it as how we evolved, how we evolved as a species is like one of the most fascinating things you can ever read about. I mean, think about music, think about art, how we all evolved. Nothing makes sense unless you look at the evolution. So very quickly, we co-speciated with our microbiome. Our microbiota changed as hominids changed. You can go back millions of years, millions of years and look at the ancient symbionts that changed for the bonobos, the chimpanzees, the gorillas, and us, the African apes. So as we defined ourselves as a species, so did our specific microbiota. So species don't have similar microbiomes at all. Not whatsoever. It's all because of evolution. Because what drives evolution is the microbiome. Plants evolve. Animals evolve because of their associated microbiome. So when you change the microbiome, you're changing evolution. You're changing the future of our species. Nothing should be so critical in our minds as what we have done with global use of antibiotics. Because it's changed where we're going, what our grandchildren will look like. Now, microbes drive because they have new generations every couple hours and then they share the microbiome now when we look at a person this guy right here is a holobiome he has his own microbiome he has his own genome he has his symbionts and together that makes the holo genome and the holo genome is the entirety of your genome your microbiome and also the genome of the microbiome and that drives evolution, animals or plants. And it's important to realize plants, because plants, we've changed too, a lot, haven't we? Global changes. So like it or not, microbiology is gonna be the center of evolutionary study in the future and vice versa. That is what's driving everything. Horizontal gene transfer, lateral gene transfer. They share genes. Genes for antibiotic resistance, right? So. When we change bacteria, we change evolution, and we just have to look at the tree of life. The new tree of life shows how the mitochondria came from bacteria into the eukaryotes. Now we know what, just last week, protosomes come from bacteria. A lot of our organelles come from bacteria. And we share a lot of things with plants, especially when it comes to changes in humans, plants. And of course, GMOs, we're not gonna go there because God knows, only God knows on GMOs. So let's go back in time. Let's look at the Hadza hunter-gatherers. I know some of you have heard me talk about this before, but we can look back in time to our predecessors, the hominins who are digging up these big tubers in Africa. And remember, Homo came out of Africa and the hominins, you know, part of the Homo group, they were digging up these tubers, and these tubers were important because they changed the evolution of our teeth. Mankind has the most specialized dentition of any animal. And they have shown that the hominins' teeth changed to manage the use of tubers and early development. So this is all well published. There's a lot of articles here I have. Very well published. This is from the American Journal of Physical Anthropology. And in those tubers were polyols. That's why you can take xylitol, ribitol, maltitol, and you've gave it to your dog, they can't. 
Dogs never developed to do that. They never evolved to do that. Dogs can't have chocolate either, most of them, right? So they are completely different. But if you look on the outside of all plants, the saccharose and the polyols are there. That means that we ate those all the time, and we'll see some really definitive proof on the development. Here's the African tubers. They're huge, and they saved mankind. They saved during drought. That's how the hominins survived was digging those up. And of course they didn't peel. Peeling a vegetable is a horrible thing to do because the outside has all your polyols and the saccharoses, which are important to feed your gut microbiome. So now we can go, and this is published in the Proceeding in National Academy of Science, to look at kids growing up in Burkina Faso. I know it's really sad talking about Burkina Faso now because of Al-Qaeda being there, a heavy influence there. But also, comparing those kids to European Union children, they want to look at their gut microbiome and compare it using 16SR DNA sequencing, high throughput. Significant difference. We have changed a lot. And one of the things we're missing, Prevotella and Zalinobacter. Now, Zalinobacter breaks down xylose. So you see, if you go into rural countries, they still can break down xylose, they can break down saccharose. It breaks down the large intestine, it feeds certain bacteria, and the Prevotella depletion is a horrific thing that has happened. So now that changes genes because you change the metabolites, and this is how they live, they have you know, opposite of good hygiene, but they survive. And if you look at the studies, if you've heard me talk about autism, we look at different rates of autism in rural Africa as to uh, uh, urban Africa, it's huge the difference in autism. And that's because the lack of these bacteria that, find, that happens in urban society. So here, again, they have a big increase of short chain fatty acids coming from the xylobacter, the Prevotella, the Brutiber Vibrio, and the Treponema. And there are protective effects especially from butyrate being produced by these bacteria. And we'll talk about acetonin too. So they protect the gut, but they do far more than that. They reduce inflammation. So the diet was so important in reducing inflammation. Butyrate is protective, gut and neuroprotective. I'll show you some research that just came out. And I'll tell you about some that's coming out on the importance of butyrate in protecting the brain. The big difference here, look at that dark green up here. See that dark green? That's the percentage of Prevotella that the Burkina Faso kids have. You see none in Europe. When you westernize a diet, you completely, totally, utterly change everything. The light green is a Xylobacter. We used to be loaded with Xylobacter. We're not, none of us here in the room are. We're missing these important bacteria. Old friend hypothesis comes up, right? Everyone talks about that in all the journals. The old friend hypothesis. We got rid of the good guys, which was a terrible thing to do. In effect, you all know this. Great increase in immune-mediated diseases. And now we know which bacteria are actually missing, which is an important thing. Now there's been changes over time. During the early Middle Ages, things got better because diet actually improved. There's other theories. Dr. Milligan here often comments on the helmets. He says, look at those helmets. We must all realize that those are simply survivors from the Death Star that came to our planet <laughs> and brought technology with. You can see from the bridge of the Death Star. Little did we realize they actually, Darth Vader made it to Earth and survived too and I will now unmask him. <laughs> yeah. But that was the diet. You know, the thing about diet, and my, my youngest son, he's in graduate school in, in theoretical math, but he works a lot on, he's crazy about diets and, and everything, the microbiome also. And uh, people, that was a diverse meal. I'll show you the list of what they ate. Because you ate what you got that day. So you'd be eating pigeons, next day you'd be eating deer, next day you'd be eating ox, and you'd be eating vegetables and fruits that they became fresh. So your diet actually varied significantly. And uh, 
I dropped out those slides for space. It was not McDonald's. And we have people go to McDonald's two or three times a week. That's not a varied diet at all. But if you look at their diet, it was unbelievable because they would fish. If they got fish, they ate fish. And so when you talk about a balanced diet, a balanced diet isn't what you think. It's not a meal with vegetable, meat, grains, all that. That's not right. It might just be the meat. And later that day, you have just vegetables. And many people postulate that's vastly better for your microbiome not to throw carbs, protein, fats together. Yeah, it's completely different than what people used to think. Completely different. So, when Scientific American publishes that bacteria in the placenta changes human health, pretty much everyone knows that babies aren't born sterile. That's such an important thing. It was such an old, you know how many old concepts we have that are totally wrong? It's unbelievable how many horrible concepts that people believe because they were taught that in school. It's so ridiculous. The placenta has a unique microbiome. This is from Science Translational Medicine. Great work done by Kirsty Argard, who is this phenomenal OB-GYN out of Baylor, who's done these great research projects like the Malawi one, where they have 10,000 pregnant women. They broke them in three groups, and a third of them are getting xylitol, and the miscarriage rate dropped a lot. The uh, uh, low birth rate dropped a lot. But the placental microbiome is related to the oral microbiome. So that is what it's related to. If you change the oral microbiome in a mom, you change the placental microbiome, which changes the fetal microbiome, and you change the health of the developing baby. Well proven. And especially missing certain bacteria, they don't, you don't have any serotonin production, and the brain doesn't develop right by the missing of certain bacteria. So the placenta is distinct, but closest to the oral cavity, which makes total sense. Preterm babies have a completely different microbiome because it never finished forming before birth. And antibiotics. Even a history of antibiotics years before the pregnancy changed the placental microbiome. So it changed the development of the baby. Even years before. Why it's so important to not do the antibiotics and watch what you eat. Because what, what you eat goes to the baby, right? So, mouth rinses are good for you, right? Can we really sterilize the mouth? Do you really want to sterilize the mouth? You can't sterilize the mouth. What are we trying to do and what bacteria are we killing? Very important concept because I can show you dozens of these articles that the mouth is full of nitrate-reducing bacteria that prevent decay and, and periodontal disease. So the mouth is full of protective bacteria. It's loaded down with one. You know, famous ones like Streptococcus aureolus, and Strep uberus, and Strep rodii. Strep aureolus, Strep uberus, that, those were discussed by Jeff Hillman in 1978 and 1981. We have known for decades that what prevents disease are bacteria. We've known for decades what prevents strep throat is having strep salivarius instead of having strep pyogenes. Bacteria kill each other and they look for the same space to live. And so you don't want to kill off your nitrate reducing bacteria and as you guys have heard all these studies how chlorhexidine mouth rinses do that, they kill off your nitrate reducing bacteria because if you do that you have a much higher cavity rate too. You need the nitrate reducing bacteria. This is from 2004. And there's been many articles since then. Nitrate reducing commensals limit growth of karyogenic bacteria. That's a quote from the article. I'll always show you the article that's in oral sciences because as being a faculty at a medical school, I have to show you the articles. I'm a professor at Feinberg School of Medicine. So if I don't show you the article, I can't quote it. So here published, a great one, in current hypertension report. This is published by cardiologists. Missing link is oral. The missing link is hypertension, is the eradication of important bacteria by antiseptic mouth rinse, and we need to allow recolonization of the nitrate reducers. You guys know how the nitrate reducers work? So here's this. In your mouth you have nitrate reducers. You eat green veggies. 
The green veggies are broken down to nitrites. You swallow them. They're also nitrite-reducing bacteria. And then in the stomach, it's converted to nitric oxide. You absorb the nitric oxide. It gets concentrated by a factor of 10 into the saliva. And that kills off your pathogens. That's why eating green vegetables are good for you. Because that feeds your nitrate-reducing bacteria. And a lot of the nitrate-reducing bacteria are the ones I just told you about. Strep oralis, strep uberus. They save your life. So you don't want to kill all strep. You just want to get rid of strep mutans. And that's a question because strep mutans comes in 135 strains. And some of the strains are good and some are not. Some are protective and some are not. It's just like acne bacteria. Some protect you from acne and from cancer. Others cause cancer. So the strains are very important. I'll quote this to you. Nitrate reducing bacteria reduce blood pressure, protect against ischemic reperfusion damage, restoration of nitrous oxide homeostasis with increased cardiac protection, increased vascular regeneration after chronic ischemia, and reversal of vascular dysfunction in the elderly. What is wrong with that? Absolutely none, nothing. Oddly enough, what causes erectile dysfunction? Low levels of nitric oxide. So instead of fixing the issue, people take Viagra. And there's an epidemic of it that never used to exist. How could the species develop? How could it survive if erectile dysfunction was an epidemic? And it doesn't even make sense. But yet, it's because we've been killing off the nitrate reducers that they have drugs like Viagra. Now, this is a great article right here by Signe Feingold. Did anyone quote this to you today? Because I wasn't here this morning. The Journal of Lipid Research. Unbelievable what is in the atherosclerosis, that those lipid layers, is not from diet. Someone finally looked at it and published what are those lipids inside those coronary arteries. Those are not from french fries. So when people say to you, don't eat those french fries, it's going to go to your heart, that's baloney. Those fats, you have more french fries. Who wants more french fries? Let's order some up back there. So we were joking about that because the best french fry is one that's been frozen. It's really funny. But all the atherosclerosis, the total like receptor 2 dependent atherosclerosis is due to bacteria. And of course, they're oral bacteria, as we all know. Sidney Feingold, by the way, is a wonderful special infectious disease person from UCLA who's done a lot of research into autism. And he's published a lot of stuff on that. He's a wonderful old guy who's just done so much. But this was from seven years ago, published in Public Library Science. PDHCs, that's what gives virulence to the bacteria. Okay? That's your phosphorylated dihydroceramides. Where are they found? They come from all the pathogens. They're found in your bloodstream, vascular tissues, and brain. And he's got this great chart here. So the pathogens produce these PDHCs that causes immune, autoimmune disorder, and you can actually track them. Perfect science. This is published, again, Public Library of Science. You've got brain there, you've got gingival tissue, gingival tissue with periodontal disease, blood counts, they list them all. So you should go look this up. It's a great article. And in it, of course, is Bacteroides vulgatus, which is one of the bacteria shown to it. It is implicated in autism. It's right there. And of course, we're talking about brain effect, right? From these chronic brain inflammation. So we all know this, published scientific reports, associations between periodontal microbiota and death rates. Yes, very strong association between periodontal disease and death rates. We all know that. But it's well published. So let's go and look at kids with autism. And I'll show you some of our latest research. We just finished with autism. As you know, the gut microbiota is completely, totally different and the oral microbiota in kids with autism. Okay, so they looked at autistic kids and they compared them to children living in Malawi, Burkina Faso, Tanzania, and also Venezuela. And they compared it. They looked at the gut and what they found was kids with ASD are short what? Prevotelogenus. Here we go again. Go back full circle. 
Kravatel again. And what have they shown is important in MS? MS patients are all missing what bacteria? Pravitella histocola. So there's a direct connection between MS and the microbiome and some missing, missing species. That is what everything's coming down to. One missing species. So they look at the Prevotella, this is of course a genus, and they compare the microbiome and they postulate the issues, the changes are due to hyper westernization. And this is a beautiful chart from the article. And they showed up there on the right side in the blue is the USA population. That's what our guts look like. And in the yellow you have Venezuela and in the red you have Malawi. So this is the world gut here in green. And up here in red you have autism. And right next to that, if you look at the overlay, that's the United States. So we changed our guts to be consistent with autism. And it's, it's an unbelievable thing because this has been discussed a lot. Now, what is up with autism? This is the famous article from Annals of Neurology where they did the autopsies on autism patients who had died from other reasons like trauma on the Vargas and Pardo one. And they showed that with autism you have the chronic inflammation from the glial cells and the glial cells are turned on. They're turned on to the chronic inflammation. So you can't form a permanent pathway. The pathways are being all the time pruned. So, you know, if you, you can prune a pathway, brain pathway, by giving certain short chain fatty acids, which we talk about. Okay. Antibiotics can do this too. Because antibiotics can produce, can change your gut microbiome, so you produce a lot more propionic acid. And the big character of that, this is published in the Archives of Disease of Child in 2000, has been clindamycin. Whereas metrodiazole is actually protective. And that's why you've had all these kids who are, who are being taken down to Mexico for metrodial tr uh, treatments, and they give them flagyl, and the behavior improves, and everything improves neurologically, but you can't stay on flagyl all your life. What do you fight bacteria with? Bacteria. You don't fight bacteria with anything else but other bacteria. If you're having an insurgency, you hire the local tribes to handle the insurgency. I mean, you ask anyone with military background, they'll tell you, that's what you do. Everything's local, right? So let's see if we can get this uh, video playing. I had it playing earlier. This is courtesy of Dr. Mafabe. Oh, no! <laughs> let's go back. It's very sensitive right here. Okay. There it is. Perfect. Now, on the left, right here, you have your normal mice playing normally with each other. Here you have the autistic mice. See the autistic? I'm sorry, rat, actually. Uh, it's a long Evans rat, and it's turning around in circles. And here these two rats are autistic, will not communicate with each other, whereas the normal rats are always sniffing each other's butts. And we postulate that's because they're Canadian rats. Now, Dr. Mafabe, he's actually the leader of the research group, and uh, he's a famous neurologist, a uh, very famous neurologist from Canada, and that's just myself and uh, Bill Cabot, head of our Special Infectious Disease Lab. He's retiring. This is a horrible thing. This is a horrible thing. All these people are retiring, and uh, we're actually looking at some of the autistic rats and putting them through mazes and so on, and they are autistic. I mean, we do the histology on them and look at the brains and all that. Now, there's a lot of medical models for this, by the way. And propionic acid, if you inject in the brain of a, of a rat, they, go, they become autistic. If you put it in their food, they become autistic. If you put it in their water, if you inject in the brain, just in the, in the ventricles, and you get, let it dissipate, they go back to being normal. So it's really fascinating that propionic will do this. Propionic is a short-chain fatty acid. Like a short-chain fatty acid, it's like alcohol. It goes right straight through the blood-brain barrier, right into cells. And it can poison your mitochondria. Now, there's many articles showing the medical model of this because valproate or Depakote caused a big issue, right? Remember Depakote? They were giving it out like candy. It was the large, second largest lawsuit settlement in pharmaceutical history because it caused autism in the offspring of the moms taking the Depakote. 
And Depakote itself is extremely similar valproic acid to actually what you have with propionate. That short chain fatty acid, if you overlay them, you see that the active group of valproic is actually a propionate. So we kind of establish that. And what we wanted to do was see if we could have an inhibitory effect on the bacteria associated 